Thank you very much, John. It's a great pleasure finally to be here. Um, so first I'd like to thank the organizers for having invited me to be part of this special birthday celebration. And I'd like to say a very warm happy birthday to my dear friend Bjorn, whom I've known for longer than I can count at this point, I think. And it's uh, been a great pleasure to, to be your colleague and to be your friend for many years now. And uh, so it's, I'm delighted to be part of this celebration. Unfortunately, I'm only briefly part of the celebration thanks to KLM. <laughs> <laughs> Or rather, thanks to a storm, I guess, called Polly that uh, closed down uh, Amsterdam Airport on Wednesday so that I only got here yesterday or got to Hall Holland yesterday afternoon and only here at the very end of the gong show. So, And uh, since today is my husband's birthday, I'm out of here after my talk. So today I'm one of those people who shows up to give only her talk and then bye-bye. But uh, <laughs> I assure you this is really not who I am and I'm not doing it because I I would really have loved to hear other talks as well, but oh well, such is life. Also, um, I owe you, um, I, I, I think that the uh, truth and advertising uh, authorities would uh, say that I was yeah, exaggerating a bit with the title for this talk. I mean, when I saw that everything, there was so much talk about Mativic, this and that this week, I thought, uh-oh. Um, so I dug out some, some work that I did with uh, Agnes Baudry, there's a you missing. Uh, and uh, Magdalena and Mona and Vesna a few years ago with Women in Topology to actually make a connection between some more recent work and some things about motivic spaces and spectra. But this will be like five minutes at the end, so I probably shouldn't have <laughs> maybe put that in the title. But, you know, anyway. So today I'm going to talk about some work. Many of you, I think, have heard at least parts of the story, probably more than once. But I'm going to try to put a new spin on it and hope that uh, you won't get too bored in the process. So I want to start, because not everybody has heard this story. Um, uh, it will take a little while to get used to this. Um, with just talking about what shadows on bi categories are, and then talking about the particular case of Hochschild shadows in a very general context, and then make the connection at the very end with motivic spaces and spectra. So I'll start with just a reminder or telling you about shadows on bi categories. So this was originally work by Kate Ponto around uh, 2010, if I'm not wrong, yes, which is also very nicely summarized in work that she did with Jonathan Campbell that, uh, a few years ago. And um, so the idea is the following. We're going to start with some by category B and C, which is some category. And we're going to talk about the notion of what it means to have to be a shadow on B with coefficients in C. So what I'll call a C shadow on B. Because this is a family of functors. So when we have a bicategory, we have a set of zero cells, the objects. And then for each pair of zero cells, we have a category of morphisms. And so what we're going to say is that so this consists of a collection of functors, so we'll call sigma A, from every endo category. So here A is a, a zero cell. I have a category associated to so the category of morphisms from A to A to this category C. So these are functors and of certain natural transformations. Oh, no. I see this moves at the standard European speed for blackboards. We have the same thing in Lausanne, slow. <laughs> Plus natural isomorphisms that are picking up sort of a trace-like property. So we're going to have natural isomorphisms for every one cell, so for every pair of two cells, zero cells, sorry, and for every one cell, so this one is a morphism, it's an object in the category BAB, and this one is a morphism in the category BBA. So theta, 
going from sigma A of, and I'm going to take the horizontal composition. So in this by category, I can take a morphism from A to B, a morphism from B to A. I have a way of composing them, getting a morphism from A to A, which I'm going to write like this. Mn, so it gives me a morphism now from A to A. Or I could compose them in the other order, like this. And this is a natural isomorphism, and this is in the category C. Okay, so I have this for all, all A and B and the one cells between them. And so this is this horizontal composition, and this is a trace-like property. And so I'm going to use the following notation for this sort of data as a pair of the collection of functors sigma, the collection of natural trans isomorphisms theta, as some sort of shadow on B with values in the category C. Okay? And so there are various axioms, of course, compatibility with all of the bicategory structure and so on. Okay? So this is what, this is what a shadow is. And for me, the main reason why shadows are interesting is because of the following key property gives me a way to talk in a very general sense about Morita equivalence. So suppose we're in the following situation where I have two zero cells, so two objects, A and B. I have a one cell from A to B and a one cell from B to A, like this. So I can do the two composites. I can compose here M with N, the horizontal composition, it gives me a morphism from A to A. Or I can do the composition from B to B in the other order. But I also have an A and B distinguished uh, identity morphisms, identity one cells, which we're going to denote UA and UB. And what I'm going to call a Morita context is when I have a situation like this, together with natural two cells, look like this. So I have a two cell eta, and I have a two cell epsilon, like this. And so this is what I call a Morita context. And when I have a Morita context in the situation where I have a shadow like this, then it gives rise, when I apply the shadow structure, to the following picture where I have the image under sigma A of this identity guy, sigma A of eta, sigma A of the tensor product in one, or the composition in one sense. Then I have theta AB, sigma B, and M. And I can go back by sigma b of epsilon. And it gives me, by taking the composite, a natural way to go from the image of the identity on A to the image of the identity on B. And this is called chi AB. It's because it's depending on what context you're in. This is some sort of Euler characteristic. And what's interesting is that if you're in a situation where green is not a good choice, yellow where this one is an isomorphism and this one is an isomorphism, then this is what we call a Morita equivalence. And in that case, these are isomorphisms because sigma A and sigma B are functors, and therefore this composite is also an isomorphism. So what this tells us is that if you have a shadow, then any time you have a Morita equivalence, you know that you're going to have an isomorphism between these guys. And when that gets interesting is when you can start to interpret it, you consider very specific shadows that give you interesting results like this. OK, so that's the basic story of shadows. We're going to see some examples, plenty of examples. But I want to talk a little bit more about the theory first before we're thinking about more about examples. So 
Now I want to talk a bit about some of the work that uh, Nima and I did because it explains why we can care, it gives a reason for caring about shadows on bike categories in general. So, so I want to talk about co-representability. Of shadows. So this is based on work with Nima. The most recent version is on the archive from this spring. And so we're still in the situation where we have the bi-category B in the category C. And I'm going to define a category, a category of shadows, shadow BC, like this. And so in this case, the objects are indeed just pairs like this. So our shadows. Right, shadows on B with coefficients in C. And the morphisms are what they have to be. It's a, sort of a follow, you, follow your nose kind of situation, which is to say what I'm going to call a morphism, alpha, between two guys like this, is going to be a natural transformation between uh, sigma and sigma prime. This one. So this... So it's going to be a natural transformation where you see these guys as functors out of the co-product of all of the endomorphism categories. And such that, well, it has to be compatible in the obvious way with theta. That is to say, if we're looking at the following situation, so M is, again, a one cell from A to B, N is a one cell from B to A, then here we could have theta AB, and we can use alpha, theta A prime, B prime, so the obvious thing can be like this. Okay, so that's basically what it should be, and then there's some other axioms that have to do with compatibility with the by category structure and so on. Okay, so now we have a category of shadows, and so Nima and I proved the following theorem, which shows that this category of shadows is co-representable in the following sense. So there exists. Okay, so this. V bifunctor, which I'll describe in a moment. So there's a bifunctor by HH from the category of small bi categories to the category of small categories. So V, I will show it, explain to you in a moment what it is. Uh, uh, satisfies the following condition that for every bi category B and category C, there exists an equivalence of categories, which is natural in whatever it needs to be natural in, from the functor category, from by H H of B into C. So by H H of the by category B is some category C. We can look at the category of functors, and there's an equivalence between this category and the shadow category. So you manage to sort of strictify the information about a shadow into just being a functor out of some other category. So let me just give names to these functors because I'm going to use them in a moment. Like this. So here, let me specify. So as I'd written my notes, I said there is a functor by HH, but in fact, that wasn't part of the actual what we proved in the theorem, this functor here that I'm talking about was, as far as I know, originally defined by, um, oh shoot, Berman. And it's defined as follows, that for my by category B, by HH of B is, really looks like what you would expect to be a reasonable definition of the Hochschild homology of a by category. So it's, I'm going to write it as colim, but it's actually a pseudo-colimit of a certain simplicial diagram. 
So in simplicial degree zero, you have the category that's just the co-product of all of these endomorphism categories in your bicategory B. And then in simplicial level one, you look at all the composable guys. And simplicial level two, like this. They can cycle around. Okay, and in fact, we can stop there. We don't have to go any further with this diagram. So that we have, in fact, have a zero face uh, that comes from solving identities. And then two possible composites, one coming from composing directly, the other coming from twisting and then composing, and so on. So you can do the same kind of thing here. You can compose here, compose here, or bring it around and compose the other way. So you have this diagram. It's what you would expect from a Hochschild type thing. This is actually a, a pseudo columnate in the two in the bi-category of categories, functors, and natural isomorphisms. So it's a little more complicated than just doing an ordinary colimit, but it's still something that one can compute under reasonable circumstances. So this actually is going to give us a category associated to any bi-category. And so if we look at what this theorem means, It tells us, of course, that we actually have a universal shadow for any bi-category B. So that for every B, there exists a universal shadow like this, which is just an image under a phi of the identity. And it's universal in the sense that if I have any other f from b to c, then phi of f is just given by post-composition with f. So it's enough to understand this universal guy. And here, this is just the whiskering. OK? So it's kind of cool to know that you have just a, a universal shadow, which is the universal guide to, under, to study. And that really, this one, where is the shadow going? It's from B to its own by HH. So somehow, the, if you're looking at any particular by category B, if you can understand the, this by Hochschild homology of the by category B, then you've understood all the possible shadows on it. And let me see how I'm doing for time. Yeah, I'll say a few words. Another reason why this is actually interesting is because it gives us a way to understand properties of shadows in terms of the structure of this by HH itself. So that's what I, I'll give you an example of that. Let's see if I can do this. So as a consequence of this, so that we can show that co-representability explains the Morita invariance in a natural way. So what do I mean by this? So let me just explain the, the general philosophy here, which is that, as I said, we can establish properties of all shadows uh, 
by establishing structural results for BiHH of well-chosen bicategories. So, so via computations, of the universal guy, and well-chosen examples. OK, so what's an, ex what's a, an example of a well-chosen example? So for understanding meridian variance, the example I want to think about is taking B to be the bi-category or actually strict two category of adjunctions. So in this case, this is a bicategory that has two zero cells, zero and one. And it has the following collections of endomorphisms so that here this would be the category delta plus, so the ordinal category with uh, uh, the zero. This would be the op of that. This one is going to be the ordinal category that preserves the with morphisms that preserves the max, ordinal category with morphisms that preserve the min, and so on. So this gives us a, a bi-category like this. And if we think about the following situation, so if I have for any b, if I look at the bifunctors from adj into B, then it's really giving me all the possible Morita contexts that I was thinking about that I'll call B. So it really is picking out two objects and then the sort of situation that I had when I was thinking about Morita contexts. All right, so now I'm going to think about the following composite. So I'm thinking about how what, what sort of uh, what sort of other structure can I associate to one of these Morita contexts, and I can do the following thing. So I'm looking at my category of Morita contexts, which is just the functor category or bifunctors, like this, from edge to here, and if I apply this by HH construction, then I end up to both sides, then I end up in functors from by HH of adj, by HH of B. So this tells me that if I know something, if I can make the computation of by HH of adj, then I'm in good shape. Well, fortunately, I was working with somebody who's very good at doing these kind of computations, and so he was able to compute by HH of adj for me, or for us, and show that, in fact, it's a category that comes from the paracyclic category and then sort of coning off on both sides. So you have a unique source, a unique sink, an initial object, a terminal object, into by HH of B. So that computation is non-trivial, but not ridiculous either. And if you think about what this is doing, well, you're picking out a source and a target and some morphisms in between. So it's a natural map here into the arrow category of by HHB. Like this. And if you look at what this does, just trace it through perfectly, just with this choice that is given to you naturally. So you have your Morita context here, and it ends up being sent where you would expect. So, or you hope anyway, to here, and then to here. And the existence of this map is really due to the fact that when you're doing this by HH construction here, the quotienting that you're doing when you take the co-limit is actually enabling you to do this kind of twist. So this is really important that you're mapping into a category by HH of B in which this arrow actually exists. Okay? And and now, 
if you restrict to uh, actual equivalences, then, so this is for any Morita context, and if these guys are actually isomorphisms, then in the end you'll end up with isomorphism. So now, the last, to put it all together, because this is still not exactly the, the situation of this map chi I was talking about, we just We now do the composite as follows. We get a functor from, we start with the category of shadows, and then adj b, one of these contexts. And then it maps us into fun. So using the equivalence that we did before, so I guess this was psi this time, cross with this thing, let's call it, uh, what did I give it a name? We'll call it pi hat, like this. And then we can do some sort of evaluation here and end up in arrows in the category C, like this. And it precisely takes a shadow and a Morita context to the composite we were describing before. Sigma A M N. Sigma B and M, sigma B, U B. So this chi that we had before. So it really tells us that the, the source, I mean, it's, it's clear that we can make this composite, but it's coming from a universal place. And it's coming from the by H H of the category edge. Yeah. No, I mean, so the, um, I mean that, yeah, yeah, so the, I mean this, this is really, these are functors here. So this, here, this category adj b is the category of Morita context with, not with more. But I mean, don't have the horizontal composition. Ah, in that I mean, sense. Like, I guess what you're saying is you can promote every shadow to have more functor reality than C did. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering like what you're Ah, it's a good question. I don't know the answer. Okay, so moving on now to examples, because I haven't done any examples for you yet. Oh, wrong one. Okay, so examples. So we all know Hochschild homology of algebras, of course, and topological Hochschild homology, since this is given the, who is at this conference. Question. Yeah. You said this button with the red light on it, but it was the circle to read it. Thank you. Thank you. And this was this one. Ah, okay, and I'm just going to bring that down a little bit. Okay. It'll never be quite as dramatic as at the Abel Symposium in 2007 with the boards that were in the, the beautiful library at the University of Oslo, where John Rognes repeated many times, you must use the buttons to move the blackboards. And Vojvodsky didn't care. <laughs> I was sitting next to John, he went, oh! <laughs> so, all right. Um, good memories. All right. There we go. All right, so now on to the second point. So now I want to talk about Hochschild shadows. So the specific family, important family of shadows. And actually the, the, the co-representability theorem that I gave you is some sort of hint that the Hochschild construction as such is really universal. And so we'll see that, uh, well, what does that give in, in this context? So I'm gonna talk about this in the context of model categories, and Nima and I have also done work on this in the context of infinity categories, but I want to focus on model categories for today. So this is based on the work with Adamic, Gerhardt, Klang, and Kong. It was published, I guess, end of last year, beginning of this year, something like that. And so I'm going to talk about, start with thinking about the, the one object case. And 
And so here, I want to be in a context where I have the tensor I, which is going to be a symmetric monoidal and compatibly simplicial. Uh, this one? No, this one. And I need it to be a little bit special, but not very. So with functorial fiber replacements, so this is the one technical condition which is satisfied in most of the categories, multiple categories that I care about anyway. And such that if I have two monoids in this monoidal category, and the underlying objects in the category V are cofibrant, then there's an induced model structure on the category of bimodules. So for every A and B, which are monoids, with A and B that are cofibrant in the underlying model category, there exists a right induced model structure on the category bimodules. That is to say, I look at the adjunction between the category V and the category of AB bimodules, where the left adjoint is given by tensoring on the left with A on the right with B, and the left adjoint is just forget. And being right induced just means that weak equivalences and vibrations are defined in the underlying category. Okay? So this is really not a very strong condition, particularly since I'm just asking for it when A and B are underlying cofibrant. So this pulls in basically any category you might like to work with, or I might like to work with anyway. And so once we have this particular framework, then we can define a bi-category on which we can then define a particularly interesting shadow. So it goes as follows. So I'm going to define a bi-category that I'll call RV. So this is the ring bi-category. And so there, there are things that are done like this in where you're working with classical rings as well. Bi-categories where the objects are rings, the one cells are bimodules over those rings, and the morphisms are morphisms of bimodules. We need to be a little more careful in this homotopy theoretic context. So in this context, the zero cells here are precisely going to be these monoids in the category V that are underlying cofibrant. So this is going to be underlying cofibrant monoids. And since we can always do cofibrant replacements, it's not a big deal to make that restriction. And then what are the endomorphism bicategories? Well, if I have two of these underlying cofibrant monoids, then the morphism category from A to B is going to be, well, in principle, it should be something like the category bimodules. But because we want to be an actual bicategory, and we're going to forget, you know, lose the homotopy structure here, I'm going to take the homotopy category of this. And you can take some sort of concrete realization of that by saying, I'm going to look at the bifibrant bimodules and um, homotopy classes of morphisms between them or something like that. So you can really make it a very concrete choice of what this homotopy category is. And I have to tell you what the uh, horizontal composition is as well. And so in the classical case, the horizontal composition is tensoring over the ant ring in the middle. Here we have to be, we're working in a homotopy context, so we have to take a derived tensor product. So if I have an AB by module M and a BC by module N well, as objects in this category, then sorry, the horizontal composition of these guys is just going to be defined to be the derived tensor product of these. And where is this coming from? We're actually going to do a bar construction. So get a simplicial object, the bar construction on uh, M, B, and N. 
So it's giving me a simplicial object in a category V, and then you do some version of geometric realization. So we had to be a little bit careful about exactly how we defined geometric realization. It turned out it was better to take the homotopy co-limit over delta up, blah, blah, blah. But that's the, it's basically a geometric realization of the bar construction. So here I'm going to be sparing you a little bit of detail. But that's the, that's the basic idea, the geometric realization of the bar construction. And with our choices of the fact that we have these things that are underlying cofibrant and so on, everything is the, the composition. So the, we get the associativity of isomorphism and things that we need like that. <coughs> and now, if I want to define, uh, if I want to define a shadow, I'll do as follows. So if I have one of these underlying cofibrant monoids, there is a functor that I'll call H, H, V, A, blank, from the category of A, A bimodules to the category V, that now is actually going to look at a cyclic version of the bar construction and take its geometric realization. So what it does, It's going to take a module M to, well, I'm going to take the cyclic bar construction on A with coefficients in M. So now we're going to have one face that wraps around and uses the right multiplication of A on M. And then we take geometric realization in some appropriate sense of that. It gives me an object in, in V again. And it turns out that if we look at the context where V is, say, the category of symmetric spectra or something like that, this is really giving us THH. Okay, so this is a generalization, straightforward generalization of THH. And it turns out that this fits into the shadow picture. So, uh, so a proposition. So this was first proved by Campbell and Ponto for symmetric spectra. And this was, and we did it in this general case, but it was not that much of a stretch, admittedly. Um, so it turns out, oh, sorry, and here I made a mistake. I really want to think of this as being in, not in V. It does give me an object in V, but I think about it as a category in terms of the naturality of what I'm doing. The target is really in the homotopy category of V. This is important. So really ending up in a, in a category like this. And so there is a whole V shadow, HHV from RV whole V, such that well, it's restriction to the endo category here is precisely this functor. Okay, so this is relatively straight, I mean, quite straightforward to prove. It's based on this Dennis Marita Waldhausen argument, because if you think about what's happening when you, so you need to show, let's write this here. So you have this, this well-known Dennis Morita Waldhausen argument to show that HHV of A with coefficients in a tensor product MN, so M is a, an AB bimodule, N is a BA bimodule, that this is isomorphic to this, in the homotopy category. This is coming from the fact that, well, this guy is coming from taking a geometric realization of a bar construction, and this is a geometric realization of a cyclic bar construction, and so I'm ending up with some sort of geometric realization of a bisimplicial object, and it's a question of horizontal versus vertical, in which order you do it. So it's, that's the story. So that gives you 
uh, shadow in this context. And as a consequence, as you know, this is a shadow, we know that in any context in which any framework, any, for any V which this holds, we're going to have Morita invariants of this Hochschild homology. So let me just, did I get this right? Yes. We'll get there. I think maybe by the end of the talk I will have figured it out. Okay. So corollary. If there exists Armorita equivalence. And B then you have Marita invariance. And there is a more general result having to do with traces where you could actually use coefficients other than A and B. So this uh, I'll just note that this can be generalized. But I don't want to get into that kind of detail today. All right. So we have this version, which is going to give us THH, as I said, when V is a category of spectra. But we could also say, well, you know, let's be a little more bold. Let's actually think about many objects, rings with many objects, and otherwise, in other words, uh, enriched categories. And this all goes through in a very similar way. So here we need to put a little more restrictions on um, our category V. So our V as before, plus it also has to be nice enough that we actually have um, a nice induced model structure on the category of AB bimodules. So a bit more, where A and B are V categories. I'll specify this a bit more in, in just a moment. But let me just give you a little bit, uh, remind you a bit of V categories. So if A and B are V categories, so categories enriched in V, then there's a way of talking about what it means for something to be an AB bimodule again. And the definition really comes down to saying that the category of AB bimodules is nothing but the category of enriched functors from A up tensor B into V. That turns out to be the right generalization of the notion of, uh, of a bimodule. And as an example, we can build a whole family of bimodules as follows. So if I have A, B, and C that are all V categories, and I have F, which is a V functor from A to C, and G, which is a V functor from B to C, then I have a bimodule that I'll call F C G from A up tensor B to V that's taking, so we'll call here, this is tensor. Here, this category is given by saying the object set, this is the cross, the product of the object classes. And then for the morphisms, I take the tensor product of the endomorphisms. So here, the objects of the form A comma B. And we sent to the V object in the V category C of morphisms from F of A to G of B. And this gives you a very nice module structure. And so a particular example of this is what gives you sort of the representability of the categories themselves. So what would here act as sort of, how can I see a V category as a bimodule over itself? So, 
So in particular, you can, for any by category A, you can consider A as an A by module over itself. So it's just saying that I'm looking at A and I'm doing this construction with respect to the identity functor on A. Like this. So this takes A A, A or A A prime. Okay, so that's how you see A as an A by module in this context. So it turns out, and look at the time, yes, that we can actually define, uh, again, tensoring an AB by module and a BC by module and getting an AC by module out of it using enriched coens. So, and then we can, it'll turn out that we can derive all of this structure as well. So, again, I have A, B, and C as before, and there exists as well tensor product like this. So this is the tensoring of these V categories. Where here, this is defined by saying, if I have one of these functors, if I have an F and a G, then it's sent to, sorry. Uh, how do I want to write this? Okay. So if I've given an FG here, the tensor product over B, evaluated on AC, is a nothing but enriched Cohen like this. Okay, so we have a way of extending all of this sort of structure. And from this, there's actually a multi, uh, many objects version of the bar construction, a many objects version of the cyclic bar construction. And the many objects version of the bar construction really gives you resolutions as you would hope it would, as you expect it to. So this gives us many objects. Bar construction and cyclic bar construction. Which I'll spare you the details right now, but just to say they behave as you would hope they would. So how am I going to generalize what I did in the for the one object case? Well, I can define a by category CV now. And the zero cells of this one are going to be V categories whose endomorphism, not fundus, endomorphism objects are cofibrant in V. So those are V cats with cofibrant morphism objects, like this. So this is the, the analog of asking for the have un underlying cofibrant monoids. And if I have two such gadgets, then the morphism category from A to B, well, we're going to write something, just copy what we had in the one object case but now we know what it means, basically. So, well, we know what this bimodule category is. And now you think, well, she's taking the homotopy category, so there's got to be some homotopy structure here. And there's a very nice paper by Lynn Moser, I think was also published in 2019, where she provided nice conditions under which one could do this sort of transfer of model structure also in this enriched context. And it turns out that the basic condition is actually a condition on the underlying monoidal category, asking it for it to be what's called a locally presentable base. And as long as you're working with objects that are some partial sets, some partial pre-sheaves, symmetric spectra, all that works out very nicely. Chain complexes as well. So this is not that much of a restriction. So we have, this is the plus other conditions there that I was talking about. So it's a little bit stricter, but not that much. And so we again are going to define this thing to be a derived tensor product. Uh, like this, sorry, get there. If I have two of these modules, then I again use a derived tensor product. 
And here I'm taking this many object version of the bar construction and taking a geometric realization. And uh, basically it works exactly as in the previous case. And if I have any one of these very nice V categories, then there is a functor from uh, that I'll call H H V cat A blank from the category of R V A A, so the homotopy category of A by modules. That actually doesn't end up in V cat, but ends up in V. The reason it's ending up in V is you're taking a cyclic bar construction and you're ending up with something that's a module over the V category that is just the, has one object, and that is the unit object as its object of morphisms. And that's basically the same thing as an object in V. So this is how you end up actually in V and not in V cat in this context. And it turns out, as in the one object case, that you can put this all together and get a shadow. So, to sum up briefly, so this was again something that Campbell and Ponto did for V equals symmetric spectra, and then we generalized to show that there exists. Oh, and sorry, that should again be ho v and not v, but I'm not going to bring it all the way down. Sorry. There is a ho v shadow that goes from, we'll call hhv cat, that goes from this by category cv to ho v, with the same that's built from these pieces here as before. And so we again have. If A and B are Morita equivalent, then their V category oxyl homology with coefficients in these bimodules that I described up there are actually isomorphic. And it's just, again, the Dennis Morita Waldhausen argument. Like this. So, now you say, okay, now I have this way of going from one object to many objects. How do I compare the one object situation to the many object situation? And that's this uh, story of agreement, which is well known in, uh, in the DG context and the spectral context and so on, but that we can generalize here as well. So. The story here is as follows, that if I have one of these underlying cofibrant monoids, I can define the category um, sorry, there's a V category of perfect A modules. So perfect here meaning finitely generated and satisfying a nice uh, property. So here, if I have an M, then M, well, first of all, it's going to be the equivalent of projective, so underlying cofibrant. It's going to be finitely generated, and it's going to satisfy the property that if I harm out of it and take a left derived tensor, that that's isomorphic to harm A M N. 
in the homotopy category. And there exists sort of a cofibrant replacement of this guy because not all of the morphism objects in this category are cofibrant. And we can do sort of a cofibrant replacement here. So as Q says, I'm replacing all of the morphism objects by cofibrant guys. And you can do this naturally. And the second point is that there is a faithful bifunctor Let me call it theta, from the category, sorry, from RV into CV, that's taking a monoid A to the one category, the one object V category. So it just has one object and that it has an A's worth of morphisms and the composition in A gives me the, the structure there. And there's a way as well of extending this on modules and we have the following proposition that enables us to make this comparison between the different Hochschild constructions that I just introduced. So, so if I have any underlying cofibrant monoid, and an AA bimodule, then it turns out that the V Hochschild homology of A with coefficients in M is in a very natural way, so this is an, we call an object in the homotopy category V, it's isomorphic in the homotopy category to the V category Hochschild homology of the image of these guys under theta. Good. That seems like we've made the right gen generalization, and it's not surprising based on the way things have been defined. What takes a little more work is to show that there's actually a Morita equivalence between this pair, when this is actually going to be A, and something to do with perfect modules. So there is, in fact, a very explicit Morita equivalence given again in terms of the perfect modules between theta of A, so this bi category with one object and an A's worth of morphisms, and Q perfect A. And in this context, I can, if anybody asks, I can tell you what the bi modules are, but I'll skip that for now. And therefore, corollary, putting the pieces together, we see that the A Hochschild homology of A with coefficients in A is actually isomorphic. The VCAT homology of this cofibrant replacement of the category of perfect modules with coefficients in itself. So we have this very general version of agreement. Now I have one minute left to say something about motivic stuff. <laughs> Which is, yeah, so it turns out in this work that we did with, with Agnes, Magdalena, Mona, and Vesna, so we uh, were thinking about how to put, it uh, was more about what do, what do Galois extensions mean for motivic spaces and motivic spectra and so on. So we were looking at model structures on motivic spaces, motivic spectra in an equivariant context and so on. And so while looking for interesting examples which to apply this, because I knew it worked for symmetric spectra, simplicial sets and so on, I went back to look at that paper. And so the context in which we're working there is to say, start with a small category and look at simplicial presheaves on that small category. You have a global injective structure where all of the, the cofibrations are, def are defined object-wise. And if you take the <coughs> simplicial presheaves on a small category with that global injective structure, and you do any left Bowsfield localization to it, whatever you'd like, then you're in a context where you can apply this story and you can talk about Hochschild homology. You can also do it in, if you add in some equivariants, if you have a G action on the outside on your, symmetric, on your simplicial presheaves, this works as well. You can also set up the model structure so that this works. You can also generalize this to notions of symmetric spectra on this 
small category where you're taking symmetric spectra with respect to smashing something, whatever you want to smash with. So there's this very general context in this work, which this works. The con connection with motivic spaces and spectra is if you start with a small category, which is actually smooth schemes over a fixed scheme S, and your Bowsford localizations have to do with, let me make sure I get this right, the class of Nisnader, which hypercovers, or with the class of morphism where you take X cross A1 to X, and you're taking the Bowsford localization with respect to those classes, then you're in the world of motivic spaces and motivic spectra. But there's this much more general situation where you just say, okay, I'm going to look at sim simplicial presheaves on some small category C and go from there. Do whatever left bounds for the localization you like. You can play this game in that context. Thank you very much. I would think so. I, I haven't looked at it, but I would think so, because it all goes through very, very formally. And so, yeah. Yeah? Um, about, I think you mentioned that, like, Hochschild homology is in some sense a universal sort of shadow. And I think, I mean, you, you, I think you mentioned that somehow, if I, if I start with my bicategory, I have to match with this categorical Hochschild homology. Mm -hmm. But, like, I'm wondering, is there also a universal property for this Hochschild homology? Yeah, I mean, it really is sort of the universal source of a trace. No, I, mean yeah. the, I mean, in, in yeah. the, where your category is symmetric yeah. and hoidal, you, you have this HHV. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if this also has a universal property. Well, so, I mean, what you can say in this context is that you could take the, 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 the universal guy that you have in this context is uh, by HH of this R of V or of CV. And so, um, since you have this shadow, which is H, H of V. Maybe I can write, this is going to be a lot of H's, so. <laughs> so on the one hand, you have, for this R, V, you have a universal guy, which goes from R, V to by H, H of R, V, right? And so since you have this universal guy, you know that any other one is going to be given by composing with this. So what I don't know, and I think it's a good question, is, so I have this other shadow, which is this thing, and sort of what, you know, think about what the functor there is. Is it an isomorphism? I don't know. I think it is an isomorphism to say it's like infinity categorically for spectra, but not in general. So I yeah. think my real question is like, can one add yeah. properties to the shadow somehow be yeah, I think that's a really good question, Thomas. Thank you. Thank you.